We are going live and we are live. We are live, we are five minutes later because my computer just froze on me again. It is like, it seems to be the pain of my life. The computer frozen on me every time, but now it's working and I'm super excited to have Paul Ziska here with me today. If you don't know Paul Ziska, he's a landscape photographer uh, and one of the most amazing uh, photographers for me right now. And the reason for that is, you know, like sometimes someone might actually find a recipe and they just follow that recipe to inf like always following the recipe to get more followers and like to be to have more like to be more like a parent on the media but Paul Ziska he's always pushing the boundaries and this is what I really like and really appreciate about his work and his style so it's a huge honor to me to have Paul Ziska here and before I start this I just want to say something that I have to say because I think it's the topic right now which is the violence against the black community. I said this last week, and I'm gonna say this again. My heart and prayers go to everyone from the black community that's suffering somehow. I will never be able to truly understand what you guys go through, but I'm always here to hear and to support in whatever way I can. And with this, let's start like week five, my conversation with Paul Ziska, and we're gonna be talking about professional aspects of photography. So, Paul, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, tell me, tell the people where you live and all this good stuff, man. Sounds good. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me, Diego. I appreciate the opportunity. It's always great to be able to uh, chat photography with fellow photographers. So it's great to be here. I'm from Quebec originally, uh, Eastern Canada. I've lived in Banff, Alberta, in the heart of the Canadian Rockies for about 12 years now, and I've been doing full-time photography for 10 years. I do, uh, I shoot anything outside. Uh, if I'm outside, I'm happy. I shoot uh, astro, landscape, a little fair bit of wildlife as well, adventure photography, uh, mostly mountain-based, but I try to get out and explore outside of the mountains whenever I'm given the chance. So uh, yeah, based out of Banff, uh, have the best backyard I could hope for. I can't complain. And I'm here with my wife and two daughters. And uh, we just reopened the park a couple of days ago. So it's an exciting time to be in Banff National Park. I guess you guys were closed for how long? Like three, two, three months? Uh, we were we were closed for, yeah, two plus months for sure. Um, people could pass through essentially because the Trans Canada passes through the park. Uh, but we weren't uh, we weren't open for tourism for over two months, which made the place a very strange place to live because it's a place that where tourism is everything. I I can only imagine too. On the flip side, you have all the streets like available for you to do photography, and the mountains will be not that much crowded, right? Yeah, for sure. We had, um, you know, it was the only time, probably the, the last time the park and the town was this quiet was probably at the beginning of the park system over a over hundred years ago. And who knows it, when it's going to be the next time that it's, uh, that it's this quiet again. It was, uh, it, it was not, we saw, we saw lots more wildlife around, you know, it was kind of nice to know, despite all the negative effects of the pandemic, it was nice to see the park get a break for, for an extended period of the time like that. As much as now, uh, it's really nice to see visitors coming in again. And uh, yeah, it's nice to see Main Street getting a little bit busier every day, for sure. We always need the opposite to appreciate whatever we have. When it's too busy, we want like, oh, can I have some break? And when you have the break, can I have some movement here? Uh, tell me how did it actually affect your business? Did it affect you at all, like the COVID or, and, you know, this pandemic? Yeah, we, uh, we definitely took a big hit uh, because of the COVID-19, like a lot of photographers. Um, part of it, you know, part of the reason was that um, I, I do a lot of teaching abroad. So I had a lot of workshops that were happening outside of Canada. And we've had to uh, essentially delay the whole program by a year. So there's a lot of income we were relying on that suddenly went out the window. I'm sure a lot of fellow photographers 
and non-photographers can relate. I mean, everybody's been affected in one way or another. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, we, we've been affected. We tried to, we tried to adapt as best as we could to generate new streams of income, uh, to replace the income lost. And overall, I think we've done, we've done pretty good, but, uh, we're pretty happy to see, uh, the world open up again for sure. And, and we're, uh, we're hopeful that 2021 is going to be, uh, is going to be a much better year for us that way. Hopefully. So Paul, why don't you go up? Go ahead and try to describe your style. You said that you do all sorts of photography outside, but what is the one thing that you say, okay, this is my style of photography, this is what I like doing, and this is what I spend like, the majority of the time doing it? Yeah, my, my real, um, out of the few genres that I shoot, probably the, the, the branches of photography that get me most excited these days are probably astrophotography, and adventure photography so mountain sports uh of any kind so those are the ones that get me most excited creatively uh so that's that's most of my time goes towards those and how in photo uh, fo inside the photography what is your favorite part of photography it is planning it is the hike it is the you're a climber too right you do a lot of climbing yeah so is the climbing part is like being the place what is what is the one thing that you like you most appreciate in photography that's a good question diego i would say in a way it doesn't even have to do with the photography in the sense that um i, I think my favorite part of the whole process is just being curious and exploring and so um, I just love to see new places or see places that I'm familiar with it from a different angle or in the new light. Uh, and for me, that's what really what drives my photography is my curiosity. And that's what my favorite part of photography, interestingly, doesn't really have to do with the photos themselves. It's more about the chase and trying to um, trying to go out and and put myself in situations where the photos may or may not happen but regardless i've had a good time because i've seen something new and I, i i was able to be a little kid again and explore and that's the most important part for me and i think this is you know i i talk to a lot like i've been talking to a lot of people and i have been doing photo for some time now and one thing that is common in people that do photography is that it's almost a way to excuse to go outside and explore right it's, I, of course, I love photography, but like the ability to have the freedom to go outside and explore is something that is always always driving people. So it's interesting to hear that it's similar to you as well. So uh, could you share? Let's like some the people are actually watching right now some of your images on this light show, and I think it's the perfect time for you to share one of your most challenging. Yeah, so my favorite, my favorite genre of photography is probably nighttime photography. 
And so some of the most challenging images that I've created were definitely night images, just images that required waiting for a long time for all, for all the factors to align, you know, get clear, get clear skies, um, trying to get, um, you know, if I'm thinking about those ice climbing under the Aurora type shots, those are some of the images that um, stand out for me. And I think some of the, um, yeah, some of the most challenging images I've created belong to that, that series called Astro Climbing, which is, yeah, climbers under the stars under the Aurora, where I needed to have the right um, climbers in place. I needed the clear skies. I needed, I needed the Aurora to materialize. I needed uh, the uh, place to be accessible. I needed the glacier to have um, to be safe. So there was a lot that needed to align for those images that come to get to come together. So those are the images that I treasure the most and that are among the most challenging. Oh, oh gosh. No worries. Uh, the my the most important uh, tool for photographers now it's a bit of a cliche but I need to touch on that and that's your brain really um, I, I think people and see I think that's part of the issue with photography these days is people look outside in order to find um, the tools that they need in order to keep in in order to create the most compelling images that they can when really. I think they need to look within a little bit more. We all go into photography with our own view of the world, with our own vision. And because we're so bogged down by gear and by, um, you know, all that outside external stuff, we forget to use the brain as a tool sometimes. And I've been guilty of that as well. And I think it's unfortunate because that's what really leads to, I think, what is a unique body of work that, that is true to your vision, that's true to yourself. And that stands out from everything else. As far as gear goes, um, you know, I, I I'm Canon supported. I love my gear. I love I love how it can withstand pretty much anything. It's I love the performance. Having said that, honestly, the gear the, the more you shoot, the realize you real the more you realize that gear is a small piece of the puzzle, and that it's what leads to a body of work that really stands out, I think, is as has to do with more like intangible stuff. So it's not something that you can just go and buy at the store, right? It's it's things like going out there, being true to what you like, your own passion, instead of trying to recreate what's being done already, uh, going out there and um, experimenting and putting the experience ahead of everything else, going out there and just taking lots of bad pictures and taking chances. And I think that's really, 
uh, I love the question, but I think people get so bogged down by gear and it's just not what's going to make your photography better. And it's unfortunate that we spend so much time talking and about that. And I think that. that's, that's the reason why I talk about books and because a lot of people think it is the gear that's going to make you a better photographer. In reality, you can buy all the gear you want, but if you don't go out and explore and try and make mistakes and create like something new, refresh and just think about it. You're never going to be a good photographer, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I, to I totally agree. Like, and I think in terms of, um, you know, I, I think you're going to learn so much more by just going out with fellow photographers and looking at how they do things. Maybe ideally people that you look up to. Um, you know, when I started, I went out with photographers and I just observed how they went about their workflow in the field and how they went about their art. And I think that's done so much more for me as a photographer than just so many other things that I can just go buy at the stores. Um, I think if you find the right, the workshop that's right for you, that can, it's, it doesn't have to be through a workshop, but that could be a good opportunity to put yourself in the presence of someone that you look up to that you that you can just show up and 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 be a sponge for a couple of days and that that can really take your work to the next level and and i'm not saying i don't think you want a, a workshop with instructors that will tell you this is how you should do things and this is what you should be shooting unfortunately i think what's happening in the workshop world is there's a lot of people unconsciously they're getting people away from their vision further and further from their vision which is so unfortunate in a way and I think as a as a leader as a workshop leader your goal is to is not to impose your your way of working and your vision on other people it's really to facilitate um, you know try to get other people to create the, the the images that the that pop up in their mind's eye right going from that step to actually seeing the image on a memory card to me that's my job as a leader and those are the types of experiences i think that can really propel you as a photographer uh instead of just uh upgrading the gear over and over and over again and this is so this like i i think what i just have to break down this to people because i want to make sure to bring this point through because a lot of people like what you said here is so profound and a lot of people might not even understand because i i gonna tell you something i spent like a lot of like a, a huge amount of money buying gear thinking that would actually make my photography better but what made my photography better it was connecting with like like-minded people going out being in, in as you say, workshops. So if you're a professional and you have to improve your, your, you don't have the time, let's say, you don't have the time to improve by yourself. Workshop is one of those things going to improve your, your, your skills so fast because you have someone you're guiding. And I, ideally, you don't want to have someone that is teaching you a recipe. And I think, once again, this comes back to your style that you don't apply recipes. You always try to push the envelope. So I guess, I, I believe you're probably doing the same with your students and like people going to your workshop. So can you explain a little bit more about your workshop, how that works and like, like it is, do you, do you usually go to a location, a different location, a different country? You have a small group of people, they have like a big group of people. What people would expect in a, in a workshop with you? Um, the, the way that the events work is they're very much, they're as much about photography as they are about getting people connected with the wilderness, really, because I think that, um, for one, I feel like that's something that's really lacking in the world right now. And I feel like I, I've long felt like the world would be a much better place if people were more into nature. And so... A lot of the value in the workshops for me is just us facilitating that experience for people and taking people who maybe have been so busy for a long time or, or, or have always been surrounded by urban areas and trying to get them comfortable in a wilderness setting. It doesn't even have to do with the photography because then once, they, once they're immersed and they start to feel comfortable and they start to feel at one, 
with the natural world as opposed to feeling like an outsider and feeling threatened, then only then you can get them in touch with their creative side. Otherwise, they can't get that part of their brain going. And then then we can start talking about photography. And then it's sort of, okay, now you're in this beautiful place. It could be Mongolia or Greenland or it or could be closer to home. Now you're in this beautiful place that you got a, now you have a feeling, you have a connection with it. How do you want to, how do you want to um, document that connection through photography? Um, now, how do we just explore this place through your eyes, not mine? You know, that, that's kind of the way that we operate in those workshops. Yeah, once you get over your fear to be outside and be eaten by a bear, which is probably not going to happen, you can actually relieve and just relax and in enjoy a little bit more of the experience. So I understand what you're saying. Totally understand. Paul, as a landscape photographer, let me ask you one question. What is the one thing that you see that really upsets you when you're in the trail? And I'm asking this because I was in a three days hike and the amount of plastic plastic bottles I have seen the trail, it was unbelievable. It, it, this hurts me inside to see that some people don't really care about nature. What is the one thing for you that actually really upsets you? You know, I, I live in a place where we see a lot of um, questionable behavior, right? Most visited national park in Canada, we get millions of people every year. On a non-COVID year, we get millions of people. And we see a lot of strange behavior and really almost on a daily basis, I'll see things that are nowhere not sustainable for the landscape. And, you know, what I've realized is a lot of the time, though, is people or people need to be educated. It's not done maliciously. A lot of the time I find that people, you just need to tell them, look, you can do this here. It's not it's not appropriate to do this. Right. Uh, sometimes it's just. Um, People don't live in a national park, so they might not be aware that you can't just pick the flowers and take them home, you know? And it, I think it's important to show some empathy for those people as opposed to just, it's easy to just bash up the tourists all sure. the time, right? And there, there's people, there are people who come here who fully knowingly do something that's illegal in order to get attention and boost their online stats or whatever the reason. And that happens too. But the vast majority of the time, it's people who don't mean any harm. They just need to be pointed in the right direction. And uh, but, you know, what what gets me cranky is when people do things maliciously and they, there's nothing that you can tell them to change their minds. And I, I think that's really unfortunate because, um, you know, I, I, I. As a landscape photographer, uh, I think when you do this for work uh, or when you're really into landscape photography, I think you realize when you've been doing it for a little while, you need to there, you need to find a way to work in a way that's sustainable, right? Because it, it sustains you in the in, in the long run as well. Um, and I think, you know, so and I think it's easy to just not think long term and just uh, and there, there's a lot of entitlements from people who just come to uh, the mountain parks. And they feel like, well, um, I don't think they, I don't think they understand the additive effect of people's actions. You know, when you have five million people picking flowers or feeding the wildlife or dumping garbage beside the garbage can, you know, it's it, it really adds up. And I think, um, it, I think it, as photographers, we have just such a great opportunity. To sense to, to to make people more sensitive to that that issue and just remind people that uh, we're in it. It's a marathon, right? We're in it for for, in, for the long run. We have to make sure that we do things in a sustainable way. Um, but there, there's lots of things that are, are you know are, are lots of behavior that's questionable. That's unfortunate. Uh, but there's also lots of people who just go by the rules and go home after a wonderful experience and they're very respectful and fortunately you just hear about the bad stuff but i'm hoping that i'm hoping that the pandemic has given people time to realize how much nature means to them and i'm hoping that we're going to see less and less of that questionable behavior when people start to return to wild places again 
Paul, when was the moment in your life that you said, okay, photography is going to be my full-time job, you know? Because I feel that photographers usually, they, like, I almost say that you don't, you don't choose to be photographer. Photographers choose you. That was what happened to me for sure. When was the moment in your life that you said, okay, photography is like something I'm going to be doing professionally? Yeah, well, the way that it worked for me is I moved to Banff and I was looking for a way to work outside as much as I could. And so photography seemed like an interesting avenue to explore. And what I did is I, I saved up some money um, and I decided to put myself in a financial position where I could just drop everything for a full year and go right go hard after photography and just live and breathe and live and breathe photography for 12 straight months and the idea was that well if i can make it work after a year then we're going to keep keep going along with it and but also fully knowing that uh, it might provide almost no income and that i would have to fall back on something else and that's that was kind of the decisive moment for me i think about midway through that first year and i didn't have kids back then it was just me so i didn't need a lot of money but halfway through that first year i think i realized that um it, i could make it sustainable fi from a financial standpoint and so i kind of never looked back after that so for me it was more uh yeah i gave it a year uh and then um and then just decided that uh, yeah, I was I was good to go for another year, and then one thing led to another, and here we are, ten years. Another later. year, and another year, and another year, and there you go. So in those ten years, you have been doing this. What are the highlights in your career? Like, what is the one thing to say? Okay, I'm really really proud about this. And I guess that I know you. It's funny because you drive through the parks Canada. And there's all those. Uh, Images, all the images in those uh, banners are from Paul Ziska, and so it, it is funny that it's all I can, I have like oh it's Paul Ziska Paul Ziska, so of course uh, one of the things like one of the highlights could be you bringing awareness to the beauty of the Banff and National Park. But for you, what is the one thing that makes you really proud of in your career? Career, what's the highlight? Oh, that's a great question. I think there, there's two things that come to mind. One of them is um, Offbeat, which is uh, the education uh, education photo company that I started with my friend Dave Brosha a few years back. And, and through that, we're able to facilitate, um, we're trying to help people get back to the wilderness and get back to their creativity. And that's really rewarding. And that's definitely a highlight for me. Uh, otherwise, for my for my own photo work, um, I, the two books that I released um, come to mind. It's such a it's such a joy. It's so uh, affirming, rewarding to be able to see years of explorations gathered into one space in print. Uh, thing that I, I'm very I'm very proud of, and that that those books are. are you know, are, are objects that I always proudly hand over to people and say, you know, this was my life for the last few years. Have a look, you know, and, and I think for me and I, I, I would say to any photographer, you don't have to do a book for, you know, um, that's going to sell, um, that's going to support you financially, but do a book. Um, it, it's absolutely incredible to be able to see your work in print. Yeah, prints are nice too, a nice big print on the wall for sure. but. I think for me, nothing beats a cohesive body of work that's easy to travel through, that's, um, that's fairly contained, and, uh, it, and you can take people on a journey uh, through that. And, you know, with the, in the age of social media, there's always the emphasis of just showing pictures one image at a time, um, you know, standalone images. And I think it's even more refreshing than ever to pick up a book because you can you can really see a progression. You can see, um, yeah, you can see what what is you know a, a, a real uh, a real essay, and you can get a real window into the head of a photographer. I think by looking at a book, and I would recommend, yeah, it, regardless of where you're at with your photography, uh, consider doing a book. It's worth it for sure. So it, I I did a book in two thousand. It was for myself, right? In two thousand four. Nice. 13, 2013 
I got all the photos from 2013. I made a book. And I look, and this is what he's saying. This is interesting because, of course, he's talking about the professional side and doing a book for, uh, to sell for someone. But there is the other side, too, that as a hobbyist, you can create something that is beautiful. It was a beautiful book. It is, well, I wouldn't say beautiful because I look back and say, wow, this is not that good. But it was a, like, at that moment, it was a beautiful piece of art that I created. And I was so impressed. And the best thing was I started to learn more about photography because I could use that one as a reference point. So as you said, if you don't have to create a book to to sell, but even creating a book for yourself and to to see the, the evolution, it is an amazing experience. Totally agree with you. And I can only imagine like after ten years to create something that is really, really impressive, like a really nice body of work. And of course, the book ha you have the opportunity to also tell a story be behind this, which I think you do quite well, and you have something coming up tomorrow, right? Yeah, I've got a talk coming tomorrow. Yeah, about sort of uh, about my the, the 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 quest for remoteness, I guess. But um, yeah, but I think you know that's the thing that you a good point that you bring up. I think it's regardless of outside uh, expectations just it's okay to celebrate your own work if you've been doing photography for two five ten years do a book print three copies you know one for you one for mom one for you whatever right exactly. and something that you can look back on uh and, and you'll be so glad you have it 10 15 years from the road uh down the road you'll be so glad that you did it it doesn't even have to be top of the line quality it does it's not even that's not even the point right but do yeah, it exactly what was the most challenging moment in your career? What was that moment to say, man, this is getting really complicated. I don't know if I can do it. And what pushed you through that moment? Uh, the challenges are still ongoing. They're, I think they're always going to be there. Uh, the main challenge for me is balance. There's no doubt about it. Um, I've got, you know, d doing photography full time. I've got my wife, my two young kids at home. Uh, I want to keep pursuing other passions. I love to explore in the mountains. Um, I, I, I love to just, you know, I love to travel. Um, and so I think trying to juggle everything and keep everybody happy in the family, that's definitely the most challenging part while, you know, keep keeping generating income through it all. So that's, you know, that's one challenge. The other challenge we touched on just before we started there, and it's, you know, there's always the battle with outside expectations and with social media especially and i think you know just heads up for anybody starting in photography that's kind of something that i think you're always going to bump into on a regular basis it kind of comes back it's a little bit cyclical i find that yeah i've i've my relationship with that whole world has gotten better over the years but it's still something that just um comes back and and bothers me once in a while for sure so those those are the main things main challenges that come to mind nice uh in COVID-19, how was COVID-19 for you? You said that you start to do more uh, uh, digital me uh, marketing. You do more of those uh, sporadic, sporadic talks and Patreon. I think you're on Patreon now, right? So what are the tools that you use to try to overcome this COVID-19 in your, in, your, in your career in this moment? Yeah, that's a good question. and and those those new streams of income didn't come out of thin air in a way there are things that i've been wanting to do for a while but i never had time to because well because i was on the road because i could do workshops and i could do other things and suddenly i couldn't do those things anymore and for a long time there i knew that there had been demand for one-on-one -on -one, um one-on-one -on -one sessions over um you know over skype or zoom or whatever and finally, I just said, well, finally, now I've got time to offer this. So I, I made a whole bunch of those, um, those sessions available and they've been very, very popular. And uh, otherwise, the Patreon space, you know, I've always, I'd always wanted to start doing something a bit more intimate to provide more of a behind the scenes look for people who are interested because I knew that those people were out there. And I would always say, oh, I'd love to just share more of the stories behind the images, but 
or or how I edit this one, how I edited this one. I'd love to do some critiques, but I just can't find the time. And suddenly, I could find the time, and so uh, started offering those um, those other uh, opportunities, and which people seem to be excited about. So we were able to, um, yeah, keep keep uh, keep the income coming in, even though a lot of our big events kind of uh, had to be pushed back to next year. Yeah. So when you talk about big events, I'm guessing those are your uh, workshops that you go around. Workshop. Yeah. So tell me a little bit like how you help like a brand new photographer. So let's say there is someone watching this video right now and they're trying to get into photography. Tell me how you like how you help. I know I know how you helped me. So I got this the business of photography course. And it was super useful for me, like to see so many talented photographers sharing their experience. And once again, I think I wouldn't, I could buy a new lens, even though a really cheap lens because the course was is not expensive. But I could buy a new flash. So let's say I could buy a new flash and try to do portrait, but I would not get as much value out of the flash as I got from the course. So how? For you, like, how can you? How do you help people trying to start this, uh, the career as a photographer? Right. So, for people who really want to do photography full time, I would say, you know, a lot of people, so many people can do do wonderful work and take good images. And so, it, it really comes down a lot to marketing, right? And that's where a lot of photographers, I think. Um, struggle and that's where they hit the wall and which is unfortunate because so many photographers do phenomenal work but nobody knows that that work exists right because they don't um, they don't know how to go about putting it out there and putting it in front not just out there but in front of the right people not saying the right the right people in terms of the people who will actually uh, spend money on their work on an occasional basis you know the money has to come from somewhere um, so I think I, I'm a very, um, you know, through social media, I have a love hate relationship with. And so if I try to help new photographers enter the market, usually I try to just find a way for them to generate income without selling out on it, without giving, giving up on what they like to shoot without sucking the curiosity and the passion out of them. Uh, I know that there's a lot of people going down the social media route where they try to build the biggest audience that they can as fast as they can. And, and I think a lot of people, a lot of new photographers feel like that's the only way to make it work in photography these days. And I think that's a bit unfortunate because yeah, there's the risk that there's the risk that the, um, your body of work will start to look like the body of work of everyone else's. But there's also there's also so many ways to generate income in photography these days. And that's that's why it's a, such an exciting time to become a photographer, to try to go for it, to try to make the leap, because there's you don't have to play the online circus and chase the stats endlessly. There's lots of other ways that you can generate income where you won't have to let go of your initial motivations of what you really, really like to shoot. You won't have to just shoot for an audience all the time. And that's where I feel I can really help uh, if, there's, if there's people out there who want to make a business out of it, but who also don't want to start hating photography and who, and who want to, and they want to, they don't want to start creating images just for, just to please you know, external expectations. They want to keep shooting a little bit, at least a little bit for themselves throughout. And that's where I get, that's what gets me really excited. And that's where I feel I can really help. So I'm doing a fair bit of mentorship one-on-one -on -one right now. We have the business course where everybody involved in that business course, I'd be lying if I said we don't have a strong following on social media, but our business is not directly dependent on the numbers of on the stats, and I, I'm and that's the case for everyone con contributing to that course. Everyone involved, nobody is gunning for numbers online. We've all found different ways to make it work, and so um, yeah, so that's what gets me really, really excited when it comes to helping people. There is a way to make it work, 
without having to let go and sacrifice all that. It is, and I'm gonna tell. I'm I'm starting. So I have been doing photography for a long time, well, a long time. Let's say ten years, twelve years, maybe. Well, I started doing photography when I moved like more seriously when I moved to Canada, and I saw the Rockies, and I, well, I have to capture this because you know it's impossible not to fall in love with that place. And I keep I, I was doing this photography game for a long for some time, but it was like part time. Was not even like profession or anything like this. It was just for myself, right? It was a hobby. I was like a serious hobbyist, and. Last, like January, I decided, okay, I'm going to do the leap. I got the, the business photography course. And it was so crazy to see that I was going through the same path. Like, I need more followers on Instagram. But I was like, to be honest, I don't know you, but for me, I was never, never able to generate any income from Instagram. I can generate from other things, from my website, from selling photography through the gallery. But I think so many people get caught up in this like social media world. It's not bad, but sometimes can be very limiting. And so for you specifically, you have a large following. How limiting you think social media is on your like workflow, and how much attention do you put to those people comment, commenting, doing comments on your photography? I I always. I always appreciate it when people take time out of their day to actually go out and type one word even. Um, uh, you know, everybody is busy. Life is so busy these days. So when people actually take the time to look at your image and provide you with some feedback, it's always appreciated. Always, always. Um, but I found that, to, you know, to go back to where we were talking about, I found that, yeah, ultimately, I don't benefit from likes and comments you know directly in terms of finances right like i don't um my business model is not dependent on how many likes an image gets so i don't really care in a way and i found that really my income always comes from the same four or five hundred people right like you may have a massive follow and i'm sure it's the same thing for a lot of photographers you may have a massive following. It's always the same people who will buy a book, buy a print, show up at a workshop, buy the ebook, whatever, right? Buy a calendar, whatever it is that you're selling. And so that's why I tell people just give up on the idea right away that you need a massive following and instead try to reach those people who will occasionally spend a buck on what you're doing, right? True. And then that that really takes the pressure off from just growing that massive audience and keeping people entertained and happy. And instead, I tell people, go shoot what you like, stick to your gun, stick to your, your view of the world and let the right people notice and just be patient. And I'm, I'm having said that, I'm fortunate because what I like to shoot appeals to a lot of people. It's convenient that way. Like I don't have to bend, right? Everybody likes, uh, everybody likes the aurora and glaciers, and right, so it, so it's not a big stretch for me. There's always a wall factor there. Yeah, exactly. But I think regardless of what you shoot, just just try to stick to what you really really like, what you're really excited about creatively, and try to gather that audience of two three hundred people who are interested enough in what you do that occasionally they will just spend a few dollars on what you do and then let 99 you know 99 percent of the other people hit like and comment and that's really appreciated but the bottom line is that you know it's if you decide you run a business the money has to come in and i think it, for me it always comes from the same select few people everything is appreciated for sure but in terms of uh income in the end uh, you just don't need the massive audience unless your business model is directly dependent on stats, which is personally not a route I want to explore. So, and it's not a route I'm familiar with, so I can't really speak to that too much. But I, I, I'm thankful that the way that we've been doing things 
allows me to go after the images that I'm still very much excited about. And I'm guilty at times to shoot images for an audience. There's no doubt about that. Everybody knows the recipe to creating a popular image now. And I'm guilty at times for sure of being like a robot and putting those images together that I know will explode online. Even though for me creatively, they don't really get me anywhere and, and they're not that, that exciting to produce. But for the most part, I think I can honestly say that I, I'm able to shoot images that get me really excited personally. So what does catch your attention in a photography? So when you, let's say on Instagram or whatever, in a gallery, what does catch your attention in a photography? And what is the most important trait in a photographer, in your opinion? Or originality, creativity, persistency, uh, the technical aspect? Three things come to mind. Um, originality, for sure. We're, we're in a time where um, there's a, we consume so many images. I look at so much photography, like, just like you do and everybody else. And more and more, it takes a lot to stop me from scrolling, right? Like you're, you're training your brain. Your brain will only stop if you see something that you've never seen before. I don't care if it's got the aurora and the most amazing glacier and whatever in it. If I've seen it a million times, I'm going to just scroll past, right? So my brain really looks for something unique. And I'm, I'm the photo editor for, uh, for the local magazine here. And that thing that's also part of it is there's a lot of good, good images. But bottom line is if they're similar to 10 other good images, they're not going to make the cut. So orig originality is a huge one. The second thing is, um, and it goes along with originality, it's confidence. I feel, I feel like photographers who exude confidence in the sense that they put their work out there and they say, this is what I like to shoot. If you don't like it, too bad. If you like it, great. I really like that in a photographer. I think there's a lot of people whose voice online is very desperate. Like, please, please like what I shoot. Please comment on this and share that. And for me, it's like, um, I try to, it's a bit of a turn off. On the other hand, if someone is just really confident, they put their own view of the world out there and people can take it or leave it, I really pick up on that and I really appreciate it. And the last thing that really stands out to me and other photographers is intention. Uh, when people, you look at people's work and the images breathe intent. You look at the images and you're like, everything was done for a reason i can see why you you know especially coming from a fellow photographer you pick up on that yeah, right yeah. oh i i see i see why you compose that way i see why you did that i see i see what you did there and i when everything is done for a reason like that when a photographer is deliberate i really i, I think i really pick up on that and it really stops me in my tracks as i browse online that's nice to hear uh, so we are getting close to the end, but I want to ask you one final question. I think we have one question from the audience. What is one piece of device that you would give for someone starting in the photography career path right now? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, there's so much I'd love to say, but uh, and I don't want to repeat myself too much, but I've already talked about the importance of sticking to what you love. And I think that's so important. But let me bring up another point, which is, um, let's see. There's so many directions I can go with this one. <laughs> let me think about it for a second. I gotcha. I, okay. I gotcha. <laughs> Here we go. Put, put. Um, prior, prioritize the experience, put the experience ahead of everything else and start seeing your photography as a byproduct. And that way, that's going to make sure that photography is sustainable, that the fun stays in the photography so that when you go out, it, when you go out, go try to go out and, and make, make your goal having a good time out there. Right. And if you get the good photos, that's awesome. And if you don't, that's too bad. But you cannot get into photography from a business standpoint or even not from a business standpoint. You can't go into photography seriously and start to be cranky every time you come home with images that you don't like. I used to be that way. I used to operate in that way and I used to have 
certain expectations for photos and I would go spend a morning at Moraine Lake, sunrise, and I would go home cranky because the sky didn't light up on fire. And that's so sad, right, when you think about it. I just spent a morning at a place that the rest of the world would give anything to spend an hour at in their whole lives and I'm going home frustrated and, and, and I could not live with myself thinking that way and and I know a lot of photographers will relate to that they show up they don't get the light that they that that they were hoping for and they don't go home with the images they like and so they end up with a miserable experience and I don't I think we owe it to the rest of the world to prioritize the experience and put that ahead of everything else and, and put put that ahead of the results and I think that's that's probably one of my top tips for anybody going into photography whether it's hobbyist or someone who wants to pursue it as a profession it is enjoying the ride really is because I as you said I don't know how many times I planned a trip and didn't go the way I planned and it just I didn't enjoy it and it's not the way uh, I think the beauty of photography is that you can create and adapt to whatever is thrown at you and this is what makes a good photographer is being able to say okay I plan for this but that didn't happen what I gonna I'm not gonna waste my time here I'm gonna first I'm gonna enjoy myself and I'm gonna find a different angle or something new or unique about this moment definitely totally and it, it brings things full circle right because we go back to what we talked about at the beginning where i think the chase is is, is the best part of photography the, the software is so good now if it's a if, it, if it's an a, 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 an epic aurora shot that you want you can put it together from the couch at home if you want if if it's strictly the result that you're after well you can just fake it from the house from the house right so you know, so really the, the the chase and trying to witness those things in real life out there is is what keeps you going uh, as an artist out there way much more much more than the results or, or how people might respond to the results. This is absolutely right. And I think the question that I asked you, the last question is pretty much the same thing that Carlene asked is like so many new photographers getting in. Uh, so like side hustles and stuff like this what is like one uh, thought you would share with the newbies and I think that's pretty much what you said right it's just keeping keep hunger and curious and keep doing it right yeah and don't and, and I think recognizing that emulation is a part of the journey everybody at some point wants to just recreate what they see online Right, but I think social media right now encourages people to stay at that step of emulation and not push beyond that. So I would say, I would say, uh, uh, my answer would be: it's okay to try to recreate what you saw other people do, but where you really start to cut through the noise and emerge as your own photographer is when you push beyond that and go back to why go back to your your sort of original original vision because I'm, I'm convinced everybody sees the world completely differently and i think social media uh, homogenizes everything so you have to find a way to just push beyond that step of emulation and create work that is true a bit more true to your own your own view of the world with this fantastic answer and i cannot put anything else to your answer I have I shared the same point of view. I just want to finish this streaming saying thank you very much for being an inspiration, a personal inspiration. This has been a pleasure despite the computer crashing and all this mess that happened. I have to get like a my backup computer, but it was such a refreshing and pleasant conversation with you even though I don't know you personally it's the first time first contact that I have with I have with I have with you it was great thank you very much for sharing your experience your views and I hope you get busy really soon with the parking open there do you have any final words for people watching us I just want to say thanks to everyone for taking time out of your day to uh, to listen to our conversation. Thanks so much to you, Diego, for the opportunity. 
it was uh, it was wonderful uh, wonderful chatting. Thanks for your thoughtful questions, and I sure hope to meet you in the field at some point. Thank you, Paul. Uh, with this, I say my goodbyes as well. Thank you very much, everyone. This was a very crazy interview. I started my computer, ended up in another computer in my couch, but I'm so happy that this happened. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, and see you guys next Thursday. Bye.